I'm the director of the chronic pain service, among many other things that I do at Johns Hopkins. Um, I was uh, initially uh, an HIV doctor uh, back in the 1980s, um, and I became uh, a therapeutic optimist. So I watched the HIV epidemic um, try to kill everybody, and then we got people better. And uh, in 1994, I saw people come out of hospice and, uh, and go back to work. And that was a very exciting time. And having lived through that time has left a permanent mark on me. I'm a therapeutic optimist. There's a time when we try to make people comfortable. And then there's a time when we try to make people better. Sometimes those things conflict. So um, Albert Einstein said, everything should be made as simple as possible, but not simpler. Let me tell you what simpler is. If you have pain, let's give you pain medicine. That's too simple. The reason it's too simple is there's different kinds of pain and there's different kinds of goals. I'm going to talk a little bit today about some of the consequences of thing, making things too simple and some of the problems about thinking about what to do when somebody has pain. Um, so the biggest problem we face in treating pain is this. The best drug for pain is narcotics, is opiates. You have a very elaborate system in your body for management of your own pain, and the chemicals that you make that do that are opioids. Um, you have several different receptors. You have kappa receptors and mu receptors and uh, dynorphin receptors, and then you have several different transmitters, and they all help you manage pain. Um, probably none of you have ever had the uh, unpleasant experience of uh, being hit by a fastball in your genitals, but I have, and a, a strange thing happens. You have this intense pain, and then it subtly goes away a little bit, and you want to throw up. And um, opiates make you nauseated. And it's your own endogenous opiates that make you nauseated when you want to throw up when the pain suddenly abates, because you're releasing your own endogenous opiates to kind of moderate the pain. Um, the problem with opiates is that they are very good for acute pain, but they're not very good for chronic pain. Because when opiates are around for a while, the pain system upregulates. So if I take you in a dark room and block your vision, your eyes will get more sensitive to light. If I block your pain system's ability to appreciate pain, you will get more sensitive to pain. And over time, opiate pain medicines lose their effectiveness, so you have to increase the dose. And eventually, you're giving doses that are quite toxic to people, um, and you're not getting much benefit from their pain. And lastly, as you get to high doses of opiates, you get something called opiate-mediated hyperalgesia. That is now, the opiates are blocking the pain and your brain is so sensitized to pain that the opiates are actually making your pain worse. The problem is if I start to cut your opiates, your pain won't get better. It gets worse yet, but then it gets better as you get off the opiates. So opiates aren't very good for chronic pain. They're very good for acute pain. A broken bone is nothing better than an opiate. If you come in with a kidney stone, you want opiates. But if you have chronic pain, it becomes very tough to know what to do. Um, this is a quote from one of my patients at the HIV clinic. Tylox, Percocet, Vicodin, Oxycontin, and then patches. I tried them all, and none of them done nothing for my pain. Which one are you going to give me? Because people really do think there's only one thing for pain, and that's narcotics. And this guy's telling me the medicines don't help my pain, and yet he's asking which pain medicine I'm going to give him. And that's this oversimplification. As a result of that, we have suffered from, um, from not doing a very good job for some of our patients with chronic pain. So when you're trying to get patients better, what are your goals for treatment? For me, um, and I've talked about this lots of times in lots of places, the goals are function, quality of life, and longevity. Those are my goals. I want you to live long, I want you to be functional, and I want you to have a high quality of life. At times, quality of life, the only thing you can do for an end-stage cancer patient is make them comfortable. That improves their quality of life. You can't really improve their longevity. You can't really improve their functioning, but you can make them more comfortable. However, for most patients, will you trade off quality of life, longevity, and function for comfort in the short run? And that can be very difficult because sometimes patients, when they're uncomfortable, what they really want is their discomfort relieved at any cost. 
And um, relieving discomfort at any cost is very costly. Um, so you have to think about that when you're taking care of patients. What are the goals? What are you trying to do for this patient? Where are they in the course of their illness? Can you improve their quality of life? Can you improve their longevity? Can, they, can you persuade them that it's time to sacrifice comfort in favor of something else? Um, because of the oversimplification of opiates, we decided in 1980, about one, that everybody should get narcotics every time they were uncomfortable. And we started this opiate epidemic. From 2000 to 2014, nearly half a million people in the United States died of opiate overdoses. 78 Americans die every day. Opiate uh, overdoses from prescription pain relievers have th had this 15-year, now about 18-year, this is an old talk, 15, 18-year increase in opiate deaths. And the amount of opiates in the United States have quadrupled, and the deaths from opiates have quadrupled. We use 99% of the world's hydrocodone, 80% of the world's oxycodone, and 65% of the world's hydromorphone in this country, but we don't have anywhere near that many people. And that's because we've overused opiates. And we've overused opiates because if a patient comes into your clinic and you give them opiates, they give you a good patient satisfaction score. And it's quick. The administrators are happy. The insurance company's happy. The patient is happy. You did a crappy job. That's the problem. The problem is it takes a long time to sit and have a conversation with somebody about goals for treatment and why we're doing what we're doing. And this is a better thing in the long run, even though this is what somebody wants in the short run. And I've got to be your doctor. I have to advocate for your health, not for what you want right now. And that, that's a very long conversation. Whereas, you want to go up on your oxy? That's a very short conversation. The patient says, yes, everybody agrees, except it's led to this opiate epidemic, and we're killing patients. So this is uh, accidental opiate-related deaths from a paper that we wrote, um, looking at the course from 1979 to 2015. And I've written out a bunch of the things that have driven this opiate epidemic on this slide. You don't really care about them. What you care about is that in 2012, when we started to realize that the people were dying of opiates, we started to cut back on opiate prescribing, and the death rate actually increased. The reason is if you get people started on narcotics and then put them on high doses of narcotics and then suddenly stop giving them narcotics, the narcotics they go by are more dangerous than the narcotics you prescribe because narcotics made by Joe in his basement are not as safe as narcotics made by Purdue Pharma in their laboratory. And so what happened is we had a huge number of people on opiates, we suddenly stopped prescribing them, and people started to buy illegal opiates. They bought fentanyl from China and heroin from downtown Baltimore and started to die even more. And so um, we made a terrible mistake in how we approach this opiate epidemic. And there is a way to remedy it, but it costs a lot of money and it takes a lot of time. Doctors have to sit with patients and explain what we're doing, how we're going to do it, we're going to get you off the opiates, we're going to get your opiate doses down to a reasonable level. We are going to manage your pain other ways. We're not going to abandon you. Um, in 2012, this paper came out that's on the left side of the slide that showed that increasing patient satisfaction correlates with increased mortality. That is, more satisfied patients are more likely to die. And that's because if you give the patient what they ask for and they didn't go to medical school, they don't do as well as if you give them what you think they should have. And it's not that complicated. And by the way, that's not all patients. Most patients want what's best for them not what they want, but a group of patients have become persuaded that they know from reading on the internet what's best for them, and they really just need you to prescribe it. And those are the people who die when they get good patient satisfaction. And six months after that paper came out, the government started to play Medicare benefits based on patient satisfaction. That means I get paid more if I kill you. That's not a good system. Because doctors, under those circumstances, are enormously pressured to give patients what they want. And uh, this is a study looking at patients um, in practice in uh, southern Georgia and northern Florida in the emergency rooms. And what this study found is doctors feel very pressured to give opiates. They're pressured by regulatory and administrative criticism. People in their hospitals say, people come to the ER, you got to give them opiates because that's what they want. 57% to avoid negative impact on joint commission surveys, even though the, J, the joint commission said, we didn't do it. They played a big role in this opiate epidemic. 46% say to 
uh, to avoid decreased patient satisfaction, and 40% said either they or one of their colleagues had been formally disciplined for not giving opiates. As one of my administrators said, you can't just not give the guy narcotics when he wants them. I said, yes, I, I can. Not, if he wants strychnine, I don't do that either. Um, we had a patient many years ago who said, I believe I have parasites in my arm and I want my arm amputated. Now, he didn't have parasites in his arm. He had a condition called delusional parasitosis. It's a surprisingly common condition, believe it or not. Um, and he wanted his arm amputated rather than somebody to send him to a psychiatrist to try to help treat his delusional parasitosis. He didn't get his arm amputated because the surgeon said, you can't have your arm amputated. He gave us a very pay, low patient satisfaction score, went out, got his arm amputated at another hospital, and then sued us because he believed that if we'd cut off his arm when we asked him to, the parasites wouldn't have spread to his other arm. And some doctor cut off this guy's arm. And that's who should be sued, but of course, the patient wanted his arm cut off. Having, wanting your arm cut off doesn't mean I should do it. And so, Thinking critically about what we do with patients is really important. Um, this is my friend, Russell Portnoy. Everybody else said we didn't do it. Russell Portnoy said, I did do it. He's the only guy who's come forward and said, this was kind of a religion, the idea of giving everybody narcotics for pain. He said, I gave lectures in the 80s and 90s about addiction that weren't true. I argued that opiates were a gift from nature and were forsaken because of opiophobia. I shared the stage with Portnoy numerous times, and he accused me of being an opiophobic person. I said, I'm not afraid of opiates. I'm afraid of people dying from opiates. Those are different. It had all the makings of a religious movement at the time, and he's had relationships with all the drug companies that make narcotics. And in fact, when I would go present with Portnoy, he always came in a limo, and I know that he got a big honorarium. And I got a little teeny honorarium, because what I was saying wasn't very popular. It was just accurate. And as one of my friends said back in these days, he said, you know, what you say doesn't fit with what most people believe. I said, yes, the Earth was at one time believed to be flat. It wasn't flat then. The fact that people believe these things doesn't make them true. And you have to be critical in terms of your thinking about your patient and your family member and yourself about what doctors say and what people know. And you have to say, why do you think that? Where does that come from? This is a study of uh, 4,200 uh, studies that were looking at opiates um, that were commissioned by the government. And in this study, they found no evidence that opiates are good for chronic pain, because they're usually not good for chronic pain. Now, occasionally, they are good for chronic pain, but usually not. And so you have to pick which paper you're going to give chronic opiates to very carefully. I told you. Um, that when you cut back on opiates, these are three things that the CDC has bragged about, decreasing opiates in New York, Florida, and Tennessee. And in every one of those states, when they decreased opiates, the next year, the death rate goes up. Because they don't decrease opiates, they decreased opiate prescribing. Those people who were on opiates, who suddenly couldn't get them by prescription, got them other ways. Um, this is an example. So this is Florida, and this is uh, from the CDC website bragging about how they cut back oxycodone prescribing. You can see the curve goes up. They intervene. The curve comes down. However, this is what happens to heroin, fentanyl, and morphine. When those oxycodone curves come down, the actual number of deaths go up, and that's a big problem. These are states where the interventions to cut back opiate prescribing have worked to cut back opiate prescribing, and in every one of those red states, the death rate has gone up. So the answer isn't to cut back opiate prescribing. The answer is to change how doctors interact with their patients and to slowly get people off opiates and to learn how to manage their pain other ways. So pain is made up of two parts. The somatosensory part, the part where you feel something, and the distress part. So my wife, that's her in the blue. She's the perfect woman. She's also the best doctor in Baltimore. Um, she likes bees. And she used to keep bees, right? Our bees died a couple years ago, so we don't have them right now. But um, when a bee stings her, she feels very bad, and she pulls the little stinger out and says, the poor thing's going to die now. When I get stung by a bee, I get hysterical. I, you know, like one of the three stooges, it stung me on the head, you know, running around a little circle. She looks at me in a pathetic way. Um, the, the feeling is the same. 
And she makes fun of me because when I get stung by a bee, I get hysterical. But I let medical students draw my blood through an 18-gauge needle. And she always points out to me, an 18-gauge needle is bigger than a bee stinger. Okay? It, and an 18-gauge needle is more painful if you just look at the sensory element than a bee sting. But a lot depends on your frame of mind. A lot depends on what you do. The, it, the, neither thing really hurts that much. Having been hurt, neither thing, I've had surgery, I can tell you, blood draw, not big deal. Bee sting, not a big deal either. So there's this emotional component, and then there's this, so the sensory component. The emotional component at modest doses is what opiates diminish. People will say, I can still feel the pain, but it doesn't bother me anymore. So when I had my kidney stone, um, they gave me a bunch of opiates, and I started telling jokes and was having a great time, thought it was funny. And they said, well, you can still feel the pain. The pain wasn't different. Sure, I could feel the pain. It just didn't bother me anymore. And uh, that's what opiates usually at doses that we give interfere with, is the distress part rather than the actual somatosensory part. Now, you can give enough opiates, you'll interfere with the somatosensory part, but then people are really impaired. And you have to give enough opiates. Enough, enough, that's what we do during surgery. We give you enough opiate so you're kind of in a twilight state, and it really does diminish the sensory part of pain. Um, and then there's two kinds of pain. There's acute pain, which is the result of sensory stimulation of receptors for injury or trauma. So uh, a, acute pain is when tissue is being damaged. Burns, cancer, infection, autoimmune disease, and result in tissue damage. And then there's a kind of chronic pain. And chronic pain happens when people have had enough of a pain signal to change the way the nervous system responds to stimuli. So chronic pain, tissue's not being damaged. So people who have low back pain, when they bend over, they say, I have terrible back pain. It may have been that the first time they bent over got that pain, it was because a tendon got damaged. But now, it's because nerves are embedded in scar, and as they bend over, the nerves stretch and send a false signal that something's being damaged. It hurts just as much, but it's not coming from tissue damage. It's coming from the nerves. And that's what happens with diabetes. Diabetes gives you a polyneuropathy, and the pain that you have is not coming from tissue being damaged. And people will say, I feel like my feet are on fire. Are your feet on fire? It feels like it. But are they on fire? But it feels like it. You think they're on fire? No. They're not on fire. They feel like they're on fire. That's a change in the way the nervous system is reporting information to your brain. It feels the same, but it's a very different process. Opiates are not very good for that. They don't help with that very much. Um, so when you're looking at a patient, you have to think about, is this acute pain or is it chronic pain? How much of it is from compression and how much of it's from some other process? Um, so acute pain comes from tissue damage, burns, cancer, trauma, visceral stretch, ischemia, and inflammation, and nerve activation from toxins, trauma, and ischemia. So this disease that we're all interested in tonight is a disease that compresses nerves, makes them hurt, but it can cause tissue damage. It can stretch things as bony growth happens. You can get stretch that's quite painful. So you can get acute pain with this process, but also... Nerves get damaged and you get chronic pain. And so sometimes you have to decide when you're going to treat a patient whether you're going to go after the acute pain now or whether this is a thing where you want to go after chronic pain. And that becomes very complicated. Um, treatment of acute pain, you can give blocks. Now blocks will help chronic pain just as much. You can give anti-inflammatories like steroids, non-steroidal anti-inflammatories and immunomodulators. Those will decrease the pain and those things are useful both in chronic and acute pain. You can give opiate analgesics, they're great for acute pain, but they may make chronic pain worse. You can give dissociative anesthetics, the most common one you're gonna hear about is a drug called ketamine. We use a lot of ketamine now for pain management. Um, sometimes it's very helpful and sometimes it isn't, um, depending on the type of pain and the type of person, but it's a nice thing to use because it does, although it's, it's, it, it goes to a different kind of receptor in your brain, to help manage the pain. It doesn't seem to have nearly as much, uh, much uh, hyperalgesia associated with it. And then you can give things like non-opiate anal analgesics. Um, the, the most common thing you use is Tylenol, but there are other drugs that we use um, that work. Um, 
And then there's a lot of non-pharmacological man management of both chronic and acute pain. Um, hypnosis, um, used sometimes for surgery, really works. It's quite dramatic in the reduction of pain. Probably reduces the distress more than it reduces the somatosensory part, right? But so do opiates. So um, people, pe there's people who are good hypnotherapists say, I can get rid of as much pain as narcotics. And it's not true. They can get rid of as much pain as narcotics in the doses we usually use them in acute settings. Um, acupuncture works for a lot of people. Uh, meditation and mindfulness and all of the, all the disciplines that go along with it. Um, information giving, uh, you heard a little bit about that. Talking to people about what they're experiencing. Uh, relaxation, guided imaging, breathing training, cognitive reframing, distraction, and massage. These are all things that have been studied. Now there are others that we use. But these are all things that have been studied and shown to be useful in acute pain. And so when you see a patient, can you come up with a multifactorial approach to their pain where you give them a very modest dose of opiates and give them other things to try to get them through a session of pain? Um, in the previous talk, she was talking about giving kids uh, Emla cream. When I was a medical student, I hated hurting kids. That's why I didn't do pediatrics. I, I couldn't hurt kids. But I used to give kids um, uh, nitrous oxide when I was going to do a procedure to them. They basically would laugh and giggle while I was doing the procedure. And that's a, that's a dicey thing to do um, in some settings, but if you really know what you're doing, nitrous oxide's a pretty quick, very easily reversed, um, and when using nitro, nitronox, very safe way to relieve pain. And nobody does it, because it's a huge hassle and expensive. But it's great. If you're gonna do a bone marrow on a kid, I love nitrous, but not usually used. We should be thinking more outside the box when we do things that hurt kids and adults too. Um, so we talk about chronic pain. There's a bunch of different kinds of chronic pain. There's things where the nerves are damaged, uh, peripheral sensitization, deafferentation. You've heard of phantom limb pain where you cut off a hand but the hand still hurts. That's because the nerve is reporting damage even when there isn't any damage to the hand. There's sympathetically mediated pain, sympathetic dysregulation, and this is the thing you've heard of complex regional pain syndrome. That's what that is. It's the sympathetic nervous system over, over amplifying pain. And then there's stuff where your brain changes the way it does, reports pain called central sensitization. And there's two other kinds of pain I'll just mention. One is called conditioned pain. You bring an animal into an environment where you always hurt it in that environment. And then you come in and instead of hurting it, you give it light touch and it will experience pain. You can measure it from the thalamus of the brain. It's getting a pain signal. The pain is as real to that animal as when you injure it. But it's not being injured. It's conditioned pain. It happens a lot. Every time the person goes into this room, we do something horrible to them. When they go in that room, anything you do to them is going to hurt. It's conditioned pain. Um, and the same is true with somatization. People who are depressed, people who are sad, will uh, be much more sensitized to pain and will experience neutral stimuli as painful. Um, and then there's a bunch of things that amplify pain. Um, and uh, in pain amplification settings, you have to think about what's causing it. Um, I'm going to skip that. Um, and so the, in the issues that complicate pain treatment in general for me are people when they have combined acute and chronic pain syndromes. That's this illness and many of the other things I see. People have both an acute element of pain and a chronic element of pain. That makes treatment really complicated. And then they get fatigued by pain management methods that are non-pharmacologic. So the mindfulness, they can only keep it up so long. Um, the distraction, you only keep it up so long. Um, then there's immune amplification, pain amplification syndromes. They are, I'm not gonna spend any time on them, but they complicate our patient's treatment. And then there's a bunch of psychiatric comorbidities. So one of the reasons that a psychiatrist is interested in chronic pain is there are a whole bunch of things that make pain worse that most doctors miss. And they include psychiatric disorders. And I'm gonna talk mostly tonight about depression. So there's two kinds of depression. Demoralization, where you're sad because of what you're going through. And depression, where you feel bad because a part of your brain isn't working right. And those are different. So um, in the categorical one, Demoralization is that kind of sadness where people say, I'm depressed, and it's because of some loss they've had. They've, had, they've lost someone they love, they've had a romantic disappointment, um, and major depression. In that condition, it's a very different kind of condition. So in your brain, there's a circuit 
called the ascending mesolimbic dopamine circuit. It's the yeah circuit. You all have one of these. If you like baseball and your guy gets a home run, your brain releases dopamine and you get a little yeah. If you like great wine, I'm not gonna mention anybody who likes wine, if you like great wine and you're in Switzerland with your wife and you get a glass of really great Bordeaux for seven bucks, you say to your wife, it's great, it's, it's a phenomenal Bordeaux, it's only seven bucks. She says, you don't drink that much wine, you get any kind of wine you want. It's, yeah, but it's seven bucks. Squirt of dopamine, well, yeah. Depression, the disease kind, that circuit gets turned off. And instead of things giving you a yeah, they give you a eh. And in that setting, um, some people get sad, some people get flat and apathetic, some people get worried and anxious, and some people get cranky. But all of them, so those are all different faces of depression, but all those people have lost the yeah from things. And when you take careful history, they'll tell you things are no longer rewarding, they're no longer fun, they're not getting their yeah. Um, I could show you, I have a bunch of slides of faces of depression. That you can look at the patients and see that they're depressed um, as compared to other people. Um, and nothing is, relieves that. Um, now depression happens a lot in physical illness. It makes physical illness worse. But physical illness, because it raises infl inflammatory transmitters and changes the way your brain function, makes depression worse. And is this little cycle of depression making illness worse and illness making depression worse that we miss a lot in medicine and we don't treat adequately and makes people much more dependent on more aggressive pain medicine. The problem is that not only is depression bad for your pain syndrome, but it makes you relatively unresponsive to opiates. So people, when they're depressed, opiates are much less effective, so you need a much higher dose to get the same response. Um, this is a study looking at heart attacks. If you're depressed, you're twice as likely to die. Stroke, you're depressed, you're twice as likely to die. Diabetes, lots of other medical conditions. Depression isn't just being is unpleasant. It increases your risk for death. We have to identify depression. By the way, same is true in HIV and hepatitis C, two of the things I work on. When you treat people for depression, you reverse this in hepatitis C and HIV. Um, so um, this is a quote from one of my patients. I'm not depressed. If I am depressed, people keep telling me I'm depressed. There's nothing more depressing than being told you are depressed. People who are depressed don't know they're depressed. They don't believe you when you tell them they're depressed. They think they're just going through a difficult time, and they say it's stress. One of my physician patients was having auditory hallucinations, hearing his dead mother's voice telling him that he'd failed and that he was a bad person. And he said, it's just stress. I said, no, no, I run the AIDS clinic and the pain service. If there's anything stressful, I'm stressed. And I don't hear my dead mother talking to me. You're sick. When he got better, he said, are you sure it wasn't just stress? I said, yes, stress made you insane. So teaching people that they're depressed and teaching families about depression can be very tough because the patients feel, when you break your leg, you feel like something's broken. When you're depressed, you feel like it's a part of you. It feels natural. But people with chronic discomfort and a lot of inflammation have a much higher risk for depression. Everything I've studied where there's inflammation, there's increased depression. And so um, I don't know of any papers um, in this particular disease looking at depression and distinguishing it from demoralization, but I suspect our patients are quite depressed. Not all of them, it's probably only be 30 to 40 percent, but it's plenty of them and it's probably missed a lot. Because people say, well, of course they're depressed, they're going through this. It's not the same kind of depression. Oh, using the wrong gadget. So um, depression is a brain disease, and everybody thinks it's not a brain disease, that it's a psychological disease. These are rats that we've made depressed. And you see all those little white dots um, in, this, in this side. See little white, greenish white dots? Those are hippocampal neurons that your brain is always turning over. You're constantly making new ones. When you get depressed, you don't make them anymore. And when you treat these rats for their depression, those hippocampal neurons come back. So it's a brain disease, not a psychological problem, and you have to treat it aggressively. Um, factors associated with depression include CNS inflammation, autoimmune disease, lots of other things. And um, 
um, depression makes opiates less effective. So if I give you one take-home message today, it's if somebody that you love is having a rough time with pain, at least think about whether or not there's depression playing a role in making their pain worse, because it makes pain much worse. Um, it also makes you more likely to get addicted. So people do things to get a reward. If you turn off that dopamine system, nothing gives you a reward except drugs are still rewarding. So you put people at risk for becoming addicted if you don't treat their depression. I'm gonna just mention another thing, which is some people are stoic and they handle pain very well, and other people are not so stoic. You can kind of divide people out in these normal curves. So this is what's called a normal distribution. See it here? Here's, let's say, pick height. There's short people there, me, average. I'm actually here now because I'm shorter than I used to be. Very irritating. They, don't t they didn't tell me when I was young that when I got old, I would get two inches shorter. I want my money back. Um, but uh, average height people, and then very tall people. And tall people can run faster and jump higher. But short people live longer than tall people. They have less injuries in falls. They survive cold better, heat better, thirst better, hunger better. They have less hip replacements. They have less dissecting aneurysms. They're green and eco-friendly, and they need less cotton to make their shirts. They're survivors. There's no bad place on this curve. There's things you're really good at, like survival or running, and there's things that you're not so good at, like the opposite one. And there are elements of people's personality that fit this way. I'm gonna talk about one, just briefly, and that's introversion, extroversion. Um, so most doctors are introverts. We are consequent avoidant. We worry about making a mistake. We study for the test so we won't flunk. We don't study for the test to get an A. We study to avoid getting a C. We pay our taxes because we're worried we'll get in trouble. We do our homework. If, so there's a study at a hospital uh, down south where a guy came in and he offered all the doctors $5 to get their charts done faster. And it didn't change their behavior at all. And one of the older guys said, watch this. And he, he fined doctors if their charts were late, $5. And then all their charts were on time. And the, the CEO said, but it's the same $5. Get, they get $5 more in one scenario, they lose $5, but it's five bucks. He said, you don't understand about doctors. A $5 reward isn't what gets doctors out of bed. It's to avoid a demerit. It's to avoid flunking. It's to avoid getting a black mark. Doctors will do anything to do that. And so um, introverts are more consequent avoidant. They worry about consequences. They worry about the future and they're function directed. That is, they do stuff that they're supposed to do. Um, then there are people who are extroverts. They're directed at rewards, feeling, and now. And they are CEOs of corporations, and they are uh, presidents of the United States, and they are rock and roll stars, and they are very successful, but they don't deal well with chronic illness. Because chronic illness isn't something you can fix right now. Chronic illness is something you have to think about the future and how to take care of yourself and avoid consequences. And those guys don't avoid consequences. When Clinton got in trouble, my father, as an introvert, said, what was he thinking? He wasn't thinking. He was having oral sex. No thinking was going into it. He didn't say, I wonder how this blowjob thing's going to look on CNN. He didn't do that. He said, oh, that feels pretty good. And then, wham, right? And these patients get whammed all the time. They don't, un my patients in the HIV clinic, they, they say stuff to me that's so crazy because they're so extroverted. And in, in lots of ways, being an extrovert's good. I mean, it really makes you a better salesman. Car salesmen are extroverts, and good salesmen are extroverts, and rock stars are extroverts, and performers are extroverts, actors are extroverts. But you'll notice that some of them get in trouble. They get in trouble because their feelings become more important than avoiding consequences. And so um, these people are vulnerable to being manipulated by their pain into doing things that make them feel good now, but they have to pay for later. And good doctors know this, and will help these people by recognizing they have a vulnerability to going for comfort measures before comfort measures are appropriate. They wanna feel good now at any cost. And I have patients all the time in the HIV clinic say, you know my goal, doctors, is to feel good. I said, yes, the relentless pursuit of feeling good has gotten you homeless, jobless, friendless, and HIV. Let's pursue anything else. They laugh, they say, yeah, you're right.
But these people are not not able to think. They just respond to the world in a particular set of ways that can be destructive for them, and you have to recognize it and help them. And they do, they appreciate the help. Um, it's not like they say, I'm, I don't want you for a doctor. They say, you know, doctor, you're the first person who really understood me. So, um, but good doctors know this and pay attention to it. Um, I'm going to skip that. I'm going to just wrap up here and just say a couple of things. So remember my normal distribution? There are normal diseases that are average. Appendicitis. We are great at average diseases in our culture, in our medical system. We're great at it. You have pneumonia, we know what to do for you. You have a kidney stone, we know what to do for you. You have six kidney stones a week, we have no idea what to do with you. If you have a weird disease that falls outside of the average range, we have real trouble. We want to give it an algorithm. We want to make a response. We want to do the same thing to everybody. And we want to have a little programmatic thing. If you have this, this, and this, we do this, this, and this. The problem is the disease that you're coping with isn't in the average domain. It's in the non-average domain. And in non-average conditions, doctors have to think more, be less reflexic, know the patient. Don't know the condition, you know the patient. Now the condition you have to know too. You have to know what you're doing. But you've got to know the patient. Every patient is different. This disease is different than every patient who has it. Rare diseases are like that. We don't cope very well as physicians with rare diseases. As my career, one of the things what I, my work has taught me is that not every HIV patient is the same as every other HIV patient. Not every person with chronic pain is the same as every other person with chronic pain. Not every person, I have a, I have a GI clinic that I run with a guy who we look at weird GI disorders. And they're all unique. The people we see are all very unique. They have weird diseases. And when people have weird diseases, you have to think more carefully about what this person needs and what's best for them. And uh, this is one of my favorite cartoons of all time. Um, it says, your insurance company only authorized me to take out one. You pick. What your patients need is integrated care. They need a group of doctors who understand the condition, who understand pain, who understand how to help people, who understand physical therapy and rehabilitation, who understand how to maximize everybody's potential, working together and bringing their expertise together for each unique case. And it's very hard to get that in our culture because it's not very well reimbursed. But it's the thing we need. And if we ignore that, we have the opiate epidemic, which is costing us way more than good treatment of chronic pain would have ever cost us. We have the hepatitis B and HIV epidemics, which are epidemics partly because we've done a crappy job of helping people. We are seeing a rise in HIV now and a rise in hepatitis C because of the opiate epidemic. We are not responding to patients who have unusual things in an effective way. We're trying to squeeze them into an algorithm they don't squeeze into. And so you have to advocate for people. As doctors, we advocate for people, our patients. And as families, you have to advocate for people. Find people who know what they're doing. Not all doctors are created equal. I wish they were. Um, if your doctor isn't doing a good job, get a second opinion. Get a third opinion. Fight to get somebody who really knows how to help your, your, your family member. And when they say, that doctor isn't helping me, think about who else we could get. You have to sometimes travel. You have to sometimes put up with misuse because I got to tell you, just parking at Johns Hopkins is abusive. Um, but there are people who actually care about patients that have unusual diseases at Hopkins and other, lots of other places and who will advocate for you and who will get you things that other people won't. And so seek those people out. Anyway, I'll stop. Thank you guys for inviting me. Hope this is fun for you. I hope it's useful. I admire the fight you guys are putting up against this rare disease. Yeah, I'm sorry, doctor. How does, uh, at Johns Hopkins, how does care management uh, nursing uh, segue with uh, patients like that who need an integrated team? Who yeah, who depends coordinates on the, all that? Yeah, it depends, depends on the clinic. So Hopkins is not, doesn't have a, a, general, a general approach. Um, each person has a specific. So in our clinic, in H, our HIV clinic, psychiatry is integrated into the clinic. Kidney care is integrated into the clinic. You don't go to a kidney doctor from the HIV clinic. You come to the HIV clinic and we have our own kidney specialist who comes to our clinic. Psychiatry is right there with medicine. So if you come in 
and your internal medicine doctor who's taking care of your HIV thinks you might be depressed, she can walk down the hall and grab one of my members of my team and bring them into the room. Because if you send people to psychiatry when they're in an HIV clinic, they think you think they're crazy. But you don't think they're crazy. You think they might be sick. And um, the patients in my clinic think I'm an HIV doctor because I'm in an HIV clinic and I'm an HIV doctor. Um, and you get to be a really good HIV doctor if you're a psychiatrist working in an HIV clinic because you have to because no one will treat your patients. But you're surrounded by expert HIV doctors who can help you do what you do and you help them do what they do. And we don't do that in general. There's no good way to get real. As they told me about my GI clinic, your GI clinic is doing fabulous, miraculous work with patients. Trouble is, there's no good way to get you paid. And I said, I don't care if I get paid. And they say, yeah, but we care if we get paid. Then you figure it out. I take care of the patients. I get the patients better. You figure out how to get the money. You went to business school. I went to medical school. Let's do it that way. Because they're always saying, we well, need a business plan. I don't make business plans. I can barely get my patients better. You make a business plan. I'll tell you how to do it. I take the patients. I get them better. You figure out how to get us paid for it. That's very unpopular right now. What's popular is for an administrator to come to you and tell you what you can do to get us paid better. And I, I, I've ignored that my whole career. And uh, there are many people that I stress at Johns Hopkins. Just a quick funny comment. I'm from uh, Quebec, Canada, mm. and we have uh, free medical care, you know. Mm. If I look at that picture in Quebec, they will say, we can take all of them off, but you need an appointment for each, and right. with six months S same, in between. Same thing. <laughs> same thing. Sa right, same thing. Saving money for the government, <laughs> saving money for the insurance company, the way you do that is you disintegrate care. That's how you save money. You prevent people from getting care. By the way, it can cost more in the long run. So, it sounds like Sweden, too. It, right? It's the yeah, same. Yeah. No, I understand. I was, just, I, was just, I was just visiting a friend of ours in England. He's a knight. He's a sir. He's a retired physician. He's a professor. He had, when we got there, he had uh, atrial fibrillation with a rapid ventricular response. I could get him better in one day here in the U.S. One day, I'd get him in, he'd get cardioverted, and the next day he'd get, he'd get ablated. He, was, he had made a, 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 uh, an appointment for January. But meanwhile, he can't walk 20 feet because he can't get, catch his breath. And so during that month, he's going steadily downhill, getting less and less well-conditioned. And he's going to be killed by his illness before they get a chance to treat it. Now, I stomped up. I'm very good at yelling and complaining because I got it from my mother. And I jumped up and down and screamed and got him care, um, which he's very grateful for. But I got to tell you, in England, they say, well, it's OK. I'll just die. No! Every life is precious. Anyway, what do I know? Yes, sir? Unfortunately, health industry is not moving the better way, of course. We know that. But my question is practical. For this population, are you having experience using for chronic pain management gabapentin? Yes. Cymbalta? Yes. Okay. In fact, I could give you a list of 100 drugs I use for chronic pain management that most people don't know how to use. No, for this population, I mean. For which population? FOP? FOP. I haven't seen a lot of FOP patients. There's only, you know, Two per, you know, one, a half per, one person in two million or one person in a million. It's not a common disorder. So, but, but I've seen a lot of other sclerosing conditions and, uh, and, oste and oste uh, osteizing conditions where you get bone deposition, where people get terrible chronic pain. And, um, and I used to work with the guy who uh, ran the clinic for uh, little people at Hopkins. And they have a lot of chronic pain because they have a lot of, a lot of bone issues. And those drugs work in some, in some subset of patients, and it's trial and error to find the best thing. So unfortunately, there isn't like a recipe. Um, for instance, tricyclic antidepressants are probably the best drugs we have for chronic pain, but you gotta know blood levels and you have to be an expert to use them. So if something like Cymbalta doesn't work and something like Neurontin doesn't work, tricyclics will often work. Um, but you gotta, you gotta know the case and work with the patient and say, okay, tell me, is, you have to decide if it's acute or chronic, 
if the fibrosis of, or the, the development of bone is pressing on something that's causing acute pain, you might do something very different than you would if somebody had a stretched nerve and you were getting nerve-related pain. Yeah, unfortunately, this population experiencing a lot of, uh, a lot of problem with the pain. Yeah. So we don't have much experience of treatment of this population with the chronic pain management. Uh, yep. So I don't have any information about how other doctors using that. So in my clinic, I'm using also chronic pain management. So I'm using a lot of gabapentin, yeah, amitriptyline, but nortriptyline, cymbalta. Yeah, nortriptyline is great. Uh, this population, I don't think we have much publication about this using of this medication for this population. Yeah, well, I'll tell you what. I'm inviting you to come to my clinic anytime, and I'll go through kind of stuff we do and show you kind of what we know, and you can try it and see how it works and tell me, and we can collaborate. I'll help you. Thank you. That's what I'm supposed to do is help people. I kind of like it. Is this useful to you guys? Okay, good. I just want to make sure. Hi. As someone who is on the going through puberty and the disease is really starting to give me more pain than I've ever had before, uh, you hurt, hit a lot of nerves on my behalf because of how the disease makes me feel. And the fact that I have acute pain all the time and how it would be great if you would help those of us have FOP just in general, what other medications would help us? Because you have a lot of people that, that really don't know what are narcotics. Uh, as someone who has chronic pain, I, I can take three 7.5 Percocets. That didn't touch me. I, mean, I can be in a lot of pain. Uh, when I lost mobility in my arm 30 years ago, they gave me enough morphine and Demerol for three adults. I mean, as far as my pain level is so, for how small I am, it's, so, it's very high. And I just don't like the fact that how I feel anymore. I'm in more pain now than I've ever been. Yep. And I just want to live on pain drugs all, the rest of my life. Because at what point, well, those won't work, and then they have to go to something else because it doesn't work. Yeah. And I don't, well, want to, I don't want to go there. Yeah, well, one of the things you can do is come off opiates and try other kinds of modalities for management of chronic pain. And um, so we, one of the things we do on the pain service, we taper everybody off opiates and get back to a blank slate and see how we do with non-opiate medicines. Because... When people have been on opiates for a long time, often they're amplifying their pain. There's a thing called, I mentioned, opiate-mediated hyperalgesia. Yeah. So a lot of our patients have a 30% reduction in their pain within a couple of weeks of getting off opiates just from being off the opiates. Sure. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. 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 Right, and also, if you've been on narcotics for a long time, although it's uncomfortable to get off, it's miserable to get off, you can get people off, yeah. and then you can try other things. Yeah. The problem with narcotics is they often block neuromodulators from working effectively. So you have to get people off opiates to see if these other things will work. Yeah, yeah, it's a lot of work for the doctors, and they're lazy. So you've got to yell at them. Oh. Okay. Yeah. Yes, sir. Hi, Dr. Treisman. Thank you for a wonderful lecture. And uh, for the FOP population, uh, I'm Dr. Grunwald. I'm Dr. Grunwald. I'm working at Thomas Jefferson University yes. Hospital. I deal mostly with acute pain because I'm a pediatrician right. and an anesthesiologist. Right. And there is no question that there is not one thing that fits all. Chronic pain is a specialty by itself. Oh, and absolutely. And you mentioned what we saw in many of, this, of the patients come worldwide to Jefferson because we assemble exactly what you just mentioned a team of experts. Right. Special disease needs special experts, and you need the teamwork. It's not one person Correct. that can deliver the uh, individual to the promised land. Right. So I'll take you on your word, and uh, as we are a group of individuals, physicians across the globe that deal with the uh, FOP population, each one in its specialty. We, it's, uh, we call it the International Clinical Council for FOP. And now we're trying to identify individuals that can join our effort to improve the care, each one in its own specialty. Yep. So no question, the area of chronic pain needs work. Yep. So I'll connect with you 
I'd love to. And we'll take the challenge. Okay. And as much as we're dealing with acute pain, then we will deal with the chronic pain and help this unique population. Yeah, and, and if you find the answers, you know, then you can publish them and help other people to, you know, one of the things about networks of physicians is that they share. And uh, so getting people that, most, the, the reason most people are hopeless about pain is that they don't know about the options. I mean, they really don't. I had a patient who came to my clinic, there's Thursday we have our pain clinic, who said, I've had everything. And I said, well, tell me the everything. And she went through about six drugs. I said, let me just show you the, let me show you, these, these three pages of drugs, this is, my, this is the first line of my, of my drugs. Have you had these things? No, I haven't had those things. I said, well, then you haven't had nearly everything. You've had, you might have had something, although I'm not even sure that you had these at the doses that you need to have them at for them to work, because what people don't know is antidepressants, when they treat chronic pain, need higher doses than they need as, as antidepressants. So you need a higher dose of drug than most people use. So people will use 60 of Cymbalta. You really need 120 of Cymbalta for chronic pain. So, so those are things I can share with you from a lifetime of treating chronic pain patients. You know, it's been almost 30 years now I've been doing chronic pain treatment. And say, well, gee, you know, try more. Try this, try that. This person has this side effect, try that. So you, this presentation is very timely because Professor Kaplan here is about to get the new edition of the current clinical recommendation how to care for FOP patient. Mm -hmm. And we just broadened the perspective because we have more expert and we know much more. Yeah. Many of the- And you have a few drugs that are coming along. Yeah. I, I read about some of the new things that are being, it's a very cool set of drugs that people are coming up with to try to treat this cool. condition. Very exciting. As just an answer to those to listen to your presentation, Many of the patients come to acute care and surgery to Jefferson that's provided us the wealth of knowledge how to adjust and modulate and refine so they will always get the updated acute pain management and so on. So we c I can see now more and more patients on more narcotics. They come with opioid patches, mm -hmm. which makes the intraoperative management of the pain. They're asleep, but I can see the physiology right all over the map, Absolutely. hypertension, hypotension, and they respond beautifully to intraoperative inf infusion of ketamine. Right. But no, that's, that's, that's something that we both know and it's common, and you mentioned it, just to tell you, yes, it's a, it's a way that we manage it. However, we'll collaborate, we'll connect, and we'll address the chronic pain aspect of this population, and I thank you very much for your sure. presentation. Yeah, and actually, Jefferson's not very far from Baltimore. I mean, it's, I, I go there, so it's... That would be easy. That would be great. All right. Is that good? Is this, is this helpful to you guys? Anyway, I'll be around for a few minutes to answer questions. Thank you for inviting me again. I appreciate it. Um, you're, 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 all, you're all doing an amazing thing because every life is sacred. Thank you so Absolutely. much, Glenn. Absolutely. What a great way to end the day. Well, we have, you guys have made it through an incredible day full of lots of information and an incredibly long day as well. So thank you so much. We've been back and forth down the hall and you've hung with us. Um, so we're, we hope that you will come back tonight um, and celebrate the 30th anniversary. Um, like I mentioned earlier, we did have one change and our um, second presenter on pain management couldn't make it here in time. This is Jamie. So Jamie Brown um, is with, um, Athletes for Care. Okay, that's what I thought it was. I was trying to make sure I said it right. So Athletes for Care, um, and he works on um, also with a project called Hemp Heals, and that is um, uh, Riley Cody, who was going to be our first speaker. Um, they, they work together on these projects. So Jamie is still coming. He'll be here at dinner, and he said he's glad to have one-on-one -on -one conversations with you um, if you have questions. So we wanted you to see what he looks like. You can take a picture on your phone of what he looks like and then walk around tonight and look for him. So um, we will be back tomorrow morning. We'll, we'll have dinner together tonight. Tomorrow morning, we will have breakfast in the exact same place we did today, and then we'll be back in the grand ballroom um, in the morning after breakfast. So. Uh, Rico Gonzalez is not here now because he's getting ready to start setting up things um, for the dance tonight. Um, but yeah, feel free um, to dress the part, Denim and Diamonds, or feel free to just come however is comfortable for you. But thank you so much for being here today, and we will see you uh, in a, in, at 7.45 is what time dinner starts, and here in this room. <laughs>